after is fine. So for those who haven't met me, I'm Ricardo Fuentes. I'm a PGY3, almost four in a week, finally. Um, PMNR resident at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. Um, I'm an IMG, so I've been a doctor for 10 years. And I used to work internal medicine and rheumatology back in Colombia. And I love rehab. I think it's the best specialty ever. So if you guys are interested, this is a good way to um, get a dip on some of the things we do. This is one, probably one of the most common pathologies that we see. And one of the things, I, I like two things in rehab very, very much. And one of them is electromyography, which I'm going to touch a little bit upon for this lecture. And the other one, and the reason I'm going to to become in Fort Worth, is uh, performing arts medicine. I'm a trained opera singer, so I used to work as an artist, and now I intend to work in rehab, training artists. So I'm, I am the future fellow um, for that program. So, um, and so today we bring a little. Um, kind of workshop presentation on, on um, Syndrome de Tunel del Carpo, which means carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay. Um, so I thought it would be good to do a review of the anatomy. We have some anatomy lay down here a little bit um, in Spanish, because this is to kind of like brush up our Spanish. Um, and we want to review a little bit of the anatomy of the wrist. And so can any of the students tell me, or like any one of the participants tell me, what are the contents of the carpal tunnel? Flexor digitorum profundus superficialis and the flexor pollicis longus. And very good. Median nerve. Correct. So we have 10, um, 10 elements within the the carpal tunnel and they are the four tendons of the fds four tender of the fdp the fpl and we have the median nerve right um can you tell me how to set tendon in spanish it's like a little cheat sheet here do anyone know is it just tendon Tendon, very good, yeah. Tendon or ligamento, it's another interchangeable word, although ligament and tendon are like, you know, a little different sometimes. Um, the flexor uh, retinaculum, it's an enclosed cavity composed of a, of a ligament that's very thick uh, and encloses all of these elements that we've been discussing, um, including the median nerve, which is the one who suffers the most within this very close compartment, but it sits on top of the carpal bones. Um, and how is, how is bone in Spanish? Hueso. Hueso, very good. Um, so the carpal bones, we have like tendon, ligament, bones, the median nerve, nervous nervio, and we, the target of action of everything else is the fingers, right? Um, los dedos. So we're going to discuss that because that's relevant in the clinic expression of carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a brush of a little things of anatomy to remember. Um, what are the symptoms of carpal tunnel? Like each student give me one, or like you, each of the participants trying to give me one, and we try to like get a word of Spanish of what those symptoms are. Like paresthesia is like hormigueo, see? Okay, paresthesia, how do you say that in Spanish? Isn't it like hormigueo or something like that? It's okay, like... good. So that's one of the tricky words because there's many words that kind of <laughs> enclose that. Um, in, in Spanish, um, the way we talk in the medical field can be either very formal or very informal, especially as the way the patients report symptoms. For the practical standpoint of view, um, for physicians in training, 
is to understand how patients report the symptoms so that you are able to interpret properly what those um, mean. Uh, so hormigueo is like a very good word for like that tingly or like prestigious, right? What else? You could have like weakness in like just grip strength. Yeah. Um, what is the word for weakness? Debilidad. Debilidad. Very good. Yeah. Weakness. Debilidad. Um, that's a very important symptom for carpal tunnel. Um, that plays a big role in the differentials. Um, pure pathology of the carpal tunnel shouldn't cause a lot of full weakness. Does anybody know why you shouldn't have like weakness of the grip as much in carpal tunnel syndrome? No? I think because median nerve is mostly like sensory, whereas the ulnar nerve um, is responsible for like the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Mm, that's kind of a good guess. Um, the median nerve has a very important um, responsibility on the motor aspect of the hand as well. Oh, the thinner uh, muscles. Correct, the thinner yeah. muscles. Thinner. Uh, but um, the median nerve is a little bit more precision. So the, the grasp and the precision aspect of the hand is handled by the median nerve. So this is median and this is ulnar. And the grip belongs to the ulnar nerve in the majority of cases. So it's people with carpal tunnel syndrome tend to experience more problems doing the buttons of their chart, doing more precision issues, writing, um, than having pure weakness. Although weakness is one of the main like symptoms that we want to say. What else? Loss of sensation in general. Mm -hmm. How do you say that in Spanish? I don't know. I mean, sensation, you know, you can say sensation, Very but good. I would say this whole long sentence probably that could be more concise. <laughs> yeah, no, I think sensibility yeah. Sensation, mm -hmm. like just like that word. Um, when you're learning, uh, and this is more for the non-Spanish speakers, but um, when you are learning, you want to keep your catching on it specifically. As your level of Spanish improves, then you you will build up um, on the 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 construction of the phrases and everything. But it's important to like know the keywords, sensibilia, perdida la sensibilia, lost of sensation. Um, what else do I have here? Let me see. Other things that we talked about with weakness could be atrophy, right? Clinical things that patients can see is the atrophy of the thinner eminence, right? We call it also flattening in atrophy in Spanish is atrophia, right? And then within the realms of paresthesias, there's tingling, which is like that hormigueo that we've been talking about, but it can be numbness as well, which we call adormecimiento, okay? Um, carpal tunnel syndrome can also generate some rigidity, stiffness, right? And it's, so stiffness is called uh, rigidez. And one of the main features of carpal tunnel syndrome is that it's worst at night. So it's peor en la noche. Worse at night is a key aspect um, in the clinical um, appearance of carpal tunnel syndrome. But we should know, um, and it's important to ask about it. That, so it's the prominent features. You've seen a lot of the attendings probably talking about it. Like, is it better when, we, is it better when you do this, right? It's a clinical feature of like improves with like the shaking of the hands is very classical presentation of carpal tunnel syndrome. And something very important about it also is um, the occupation, right? This is a repetitive um, injury, overuse injury, right? So all occupations um, are important. So trabajo, right? Ocupación, what do we do? Um, 
give me a few examples of of like job risky jobs for carpal tunnel syndrome. Un estudiante or un escritor. Okay, like a some like a writer. What else? Una secretaria. Secretaria. Okay, very good. Secretary. Un abogado. What's that, Gerardo? Un abogado. A lawyer. Uh, sure. It's kind of a stretch, but yeah, they probably type a lot. They read more than they type. <laughs> That's good. Um, trabador en factorio. What is that, Andre? So you say factory workers, so trabajadores and um, uh, um, fa um, good. That's a good try. Um, generally workers, uh, like a very manual works. Like if you work in a factory, um, that's kind of hard to point pinpoint in Spanish. Um, but um, like trabajador manual, like manual work, you want to use like keywords like that. Um. Very good. Teachers, professor, or maestro. Very good. That's a classical one. A teacher, um, a medical student, estudiante de medicina. Right. We do a lot of hand stuff. Um, surgeons, right? Cirujano. Um, those are also they put you at high risk. Uh, in the occupation aspect, so it's important to link those words. Uh, but the 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 percent the Presenting symptoms of carpal tunnel are very, there's a wide variety and we, it's important to identify them. Um, so I'm gonna do a clinical case um, and I'm gonna be Miss Hortensia. And I want some of you guys to ask poor Miss Hortensia how she's feeling. Let's, um, let's try like each person will ask me one question in Spanish well, ask me Hortensia one question in Spanish and we'll try it out. Okay. Hola, I can start. Oh, okay. Ellie, yeah. No, Ellie, go ahead. Go ahead, Ellie. <laughs> okay. Um, hola, señora Hortensia. Um, mi nombre es Ellie. Soy una estudiante de medicina y quería preguntarle um, qué empeora el dolor in la mano derecha. In la mano, in la mano derecha. Mm -hmm. um, me empeora el dolor el trabajo. So I keep going or uh, <laughs> you can else? you can interpret for everyone else. Okay. Yeah. You ask one question, interpret, and the next person asks the next question. Let's do that. Okay. So um so I introduce myself um and then I ask what uh, worsens the pain. What did she say? Um, doing like manual work, like moving the hand, the hand. Okay. Next. I can go. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, ¿Por qué tanto tiempo ha tenido sus síntomas? Um, yo creo que como seis meses. Seis meses. Duele mucho. Um, I asked uh, for how long she's been experiencing symptoms, and Ms. Hortensia has had symptoms for six months, and that it hurts a lot. Good. Uh, I don't know if this will be the right way to phrase it, but ¿Qué te usan para tu de mejor de sus de sus uh, sensaciones. Me mejora cuando hago así. Hola, señora. Uh, I was just trying to ask what helped made it better. I'm saying going like this. Very good. It was, that was very good. Uh, hola, señora. Um, está usando... Um, la otra drogas o tratamientos para um, para ayudar con el duelo a veces uso Tylenol okay um, so oh go ahead 
Go ahead. So, yeah, I just I just asked her if um she's using any like drugs, any treatments for her pain, and then she's uh Miss Hortensia said she's using Tylenol. Very good, beautiful pronunciation, by the way, too. So I don't know much Spanish, and I just wanted to join to say and just kind of like sit in and watch, but I can try. So um, and try. say solamente solamente la manos o uh. I don't know how to say, como se dice, anywhere else? Alguna otra parte? No, solamente en la mano. No, uh, no en ninguna otra parte. Okay. What did I say? Oh, okay, so basically, I think you said nowhere else, only this part of my body? Only only the hand. Okay, only this, the hand. Perfect. Oh, yeah. And you were asking <laughs> if there was anywhere else, right? Good. Yes. That's very important. We're going to go to the next thing of that. Um. Anything else that you want to ask? And una, escala, and una escala uh, uno a diez, um, ¿qué, es, ¿qué número es su um, dolor? Diez, veinte. Oh, es mucho, ¿sí? sí. <laughs> um, I was just asking, like, oh, on a scale of one to ten, how much is your pain? He said uh, ten, and then she said twenty, and I was like, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> Good. I have another question, and the terminology might vary from country to country. But uh, usa, uh, usa alguna férula? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I asked if he uses a brace. Beautiful. And he said no. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so there's a few cues on the presentation, and it's like, it's a worse at night that we talk about it, peor en la noche, right? And like, where in the hand? Where is she having symptoms, right? So it's in la mano derecha, on the right hand. So it's important to ask about hand dominance. What if she's a lefty, right? It's more prominent on the, on the dominant hand. And it's important to ask, where in the hand are you having symptoms? Donde en la mano tiene síntomas, right? And she's having worse in the symptoms in the thumb and in the index finger, right? Um, so classically, you guys, as a refresher of their anatomy, the after crossing the carpal tunnel through, uh, uh, through the carpal tunnel, the median nerve divides, in the superficial uh, branches that are going to go to the thumb, first, second, and sometimes half of the fourth digit. So clinically, um, it's very important sometimes to ask for splitting of the fourth finger. It's very classical um, to have splitting sensation of the fourth finger. Um, but the territory is very important. It helps us determine um, because we're going to go next to our differentials. And so we're gonna work through the differentials. I want to, I want if you guys can try to give me some differentials for this. What are differentials for carpal tunnel syndrome? Um like an AIN nerve injury. She means like it's <laughs> that was nerve a injury. No, well, the carpal tunnel is a nerve injury. No, like so, an AIN instead of the median nerve specifically, like um more anterior yeah, injury. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 That could work. Okay. Good. I like that. What? What else? Um, rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, and, and that also is a is a like um differential, but it's also a um factor that increases the chances to have carpal tunnel syndrome. So very good. What else? Diabetic neuropathy. Diabetic neuropathica. The neuropathia, diabetica, diabetic neuropathy. Okay. Yes, although it's more bilateral. So all polyneuropathies in general, you know, can 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 be differentials of that. So good. What else? Una fractura de hueso. Very good. Like a fracture in a bone. Which bone? The scaphoid. Yeah, yeah, probably. A scaphoid fracture. Very good. Or that's dislocation. Uh, that's a little bit more on the palmar surface at the snuff box. 
I'll, I'll be able to feel for a scaphal fracture, right? A distal radial fracture, it's probably something more of this volar aspect of the hand. Um, what what other bones? I just know the mnemonic. It's so long to pinky. Here comes with them. Um, another very important one is the hamet, right? Right here on top of the pisiformis. This is the pisiformis, the one we can move where the FCU tendon is attached next to it. And if you press on it, it's always going to be a little tender. There's the hook of the hammet, right? And the hook of the hammet has a very close relationship to the ulnar nerve, where if you have a fracture of the hook of the hammet, mostly always all, all of these carpal bone fractures come with like extension mechanism of fall. Like I fall my outstretched hand. Um, that could cause a neuropathy of the ulnar, which will come with weakness on the other side and like symptoms on the fourth and fifth, fifth, fifth digits, but it's, it's paresthesia and numbs on the hand. So it's one of the symptoms, right? Uh, what other differentials? When you're a medical student, you have to have a lot of differentials. These OSCEs are tough. I was thinking maybe like a decrovane's tendonitis. Excellent, of course, not only just neuropathies but like the veins is like very good uh the trainees is saying gout or gota muy bien that's very good gout is a very important diagnosis although gout happens more in the lower extremities than the upper extremities would be really kind of rare but you can have a wrist synovitis due to gout but that's a very good one less likely but radiculopathy uh, for the differential, at least. Of um, course. One of the most important uh, differentials is the radiculopathy. And now I want to see which which um, nerve root. I think. C-A. C-6. C-6. C-6 is here. Right, C five, C six, C seven, right. Um, C six is the extension. Um, it's mostly C seven. C seven radiculopathy. C seven T eight C C C eight. Uh, C eight is a little bit more, uh, ulnar. Um, but it's kind of really rare to have a C eight radiculopathy. It's more C seven, right? Uh, and that's extremely important. All of the ones that we're discussing are extreme. All of them are really important, but um, one of the tests that we're going to discuss that in a second is um, electromyography, which I do the most. Um, and so it's important to go through the differentials to make sure it's not one of those, especially at the planning and, and execution of the test, which hopefully a lot of you as physiatrists in the future will be performing. Um, so generally for the differentials, we go through the different parts, right? In the brazo, like things on the arm that can cause sometimes of her pain, it will be mostly from a radiculopathy. Sometimes shoulder pathology can cause referred pain to the hand very rarely, um, but it can hit that. In the forearm or antebrazo, something that's very important, um, it's, um, pronator syndrome, um, but so neck pain, dolor en el cuello, right? Pain radiation, radiación del dolor, very important for radiculopathy. Thumb pain, extremely important for decker veins, right? And we said diabetes, diabetes, right? For the neuropathies. Um, the wider your differential, the best care you provide. And it's one of the skills that um, as a resident, which you will all be future residents, it's uh, it's important to keep always a wide differential. That's why the OSCEs are so annoying towards that. And uh, we hate them. And then it never ends because at the end of residency, you have to take a board and the oral board, it's an OSCE. And it's awful. so difficult. So we have to keep that wide thinking all the time. We have something else in the chat here. 
C six, yeah, it's it was more like C C seven a little bit. But C six can be one of those. So now misortensia, we kind of think it can be carpal tunnel. We have some things we want to rule out, and we can do some some workup. What are the workup that you would request for a carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, first you could do like Tunnels or Phalens like in the office. Yeah, so the physical examination is very important um, because it, that doesn't include like a lot of things in the um, terminology. I did not include that, but yeah, the physical examination is important to rule out. It's not central. Maybe Miss Hortensia could be having a stroke and that's why she's feeling some weakness in the hand, right? And so we just want to make sure she can walk, right? Her strength is normal. Um, baby Mimi Sortensia um, has rheumatoid arthritis, right? So I check, I palpate her joints to make sure there's no synovitis, right? Maybe Mimi Sortensia. And so all of the things that come with the physical examination, but yeah, the more specific um, test at the, at the, um, in the clinic would be doing a TNLs, right? A TNLs is any percussion of a, any nerve. So we could do it at the wrist for the median nerve. We could do it at the elbow for the ulnar nerve. Um, we could do the balance test, right? So put the, the stress on the nerve in excessive flexion, which will irritate the nerve and reproduce the symptoms. The most important thing is for those, those is to reproduce the symptoms of the patients having Normally, that's a positive test. Um, we could do carpal grind, which is compression of the carpal nerve, right? But they... You... Sorry, but... did you do an ultrasound and just a nerve study too, or is that too early? Very good. No, that's, those are things that you can do in the workup. We do some, it's good to do an x-ray because we just discussed that a lot of the differentials include fractures, right? Maybe she fell and she's not telling us. And there's a scaphoid fracture, the hook of the hammock, the distal radial fracture. We want to check, right? Um, but then, yes, we want to do an EMG. Um, does anybody know? Well, and so we wanted to, just to review of the, the x-rays or radiographias. Radiographia, right? And EMG, so electromyography is called electromyographia, right? Um, what do you see in that x ray? Maybe our resident will give me a reading of that beautiful x ray. Uh, um, it looks like there's arthritis in the wrist, in the little joints, they're just kind of a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of highlighted areas and it looks like arthritis. Okay, highlighted. Oh, and then there's like some uh, in the little, in the knuckles also, maybe some, maybe rheumatoid arthritis everywhere. Yeah, that's rheumatoid arthritis. I put it intentionally so like mentioned, as we talked before, the rheumatoid arthritis is a very big factor to develop um, carpal tunnel syndrome, right? So if you read that x-ray, there's hyperlucidity and fusion of the carpal um, bones. I, I don't see the carpal bones. There's supposed to be eight, right? And they're all like a, a mush, a bone, <laughs> right? And the... Um, MCPs and the PIPs are all esclerotic, right? There's hyperlucidity. There is like um, sclerotic bones, like there's um, cysts, right? There is subluxation of the PIP uh, and the metacarpal phalangium um, and the MCP and the um, uh, CMC. So there is a lot of inflammation or like the, the the consequences of the inflammation of rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a classical x-ray for rheumatoid arthritis, right? Um, 
And so we're going to talk about electrodiagnostic a little bit, and this is more a little bit farther away from the Spanish, but we're going to just brush up on a few terms. Um, always to remember that um, carpal tunnel syndrome is a clinical diagnosis, right? Do we know what EMG, like what the electrodiagnostic test is for? Can anyone tell me what EMG is? It's to test like the conduction of the nerves and to see if they're working correctly and if the speed is correct and also for sensation, I guess. Okay. Any other ideas? You could look at values like the latency comparatively between different nerves, like the median and ulnar to know if different sort of conditions exist. It could determine if it's the radiculopathy the versus a plexopathy or isolated to a peripheral nerve. Good. So the electrodiagnostic test that is one of the key features of the of physiatrists, only two specialties are qualified to do it, is neurologists and physiatrists. Um electrodiagnostic, the electrodiagnostic test is and it, first of all, it's an extension of your your clinical skills. So it always comes accompanied by a physical exam, a thorough history, but it is an evaluation of the, the peripheral nerve system, right? Everything that comes out of the spinal cord, we can evaluate through an EMG, right? So as you were saying, if you remember your anatomy, there's the brain, It the axons go down to form the spinal cord and there's like also primary cells of the spinal cord. And when the spinal nerves are formed and they get out of the spinal canal, that's the peripheral nerve system. When there's no cells, right? It's only axons, that's the peripheral nerve system. And so it comes with the spinal nerve that forms, you know, some plexuses, right? There are some direct nerves from the spinal nerves or some direct nerves that go to do their jobs. They form plexuses and then, and then peripheral nerves that then go to a neuromuscular junction to address the muscle. So all of that path we can assess with electrodiagnostics, okay? Um, and it has two parts. One of them are the nerve conduction studies, right? Where through shocking the nerve, we assess velocity and amplitude of a functioning nerve, right? Um, and then and that itself has two or three secondary parts. One of them are the sensory action potentials. The other one are the, the motor action potentials. And then there are some like weird, interesting middle parts where, you know, there's F waves and there's um, H waves and there is um, repaired ner nerve stimulation and there is mixed nerve studies, right? They're all just ways to obtain information about those functioning nerves in the peripheral nerve system. That, that's all they, there is, right? And then the second aspect, which is electromyography, where we insert a needle through the muscle to check on the effector, right? I'm not now looking at the nerve, but the effector over the nerve, which is the muscle that 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 nerve is affecting right um and it's very 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 sensitive to catch on especially axonal pathology right if the axons are not getting through the nerve then that's going to cause um denervation right in that we can detect with electromyography so specifically for carpal tunnel, which is the most common MSK pathology that we physiatrists 
C for electromyography. Um, we do the sensory test, uh, specifically on the median nerve, and we can ask and see if it's very sensitive to determine the presence of carpal tunnel, especially when we do comparison studies, right? When I check the median nerve that's not working properly and I check the ulnar nerve that, you know, should be working properly if you don't have pathology of that nerve or the radial nerve, um, then I'm, I'm most likely going to find by comparing the two um, velocities and comparing the two amplitudes that I can get by shocking the nerve, um, I will be able to determine if it's working properly. And to increase the sensitivity of the test, we do two, always two, one comparison at least and one snap or normal sensory test, right? We check the, the, the motor nerves, which are less sensitive, right? The, the sensory nerves are big and myelinated. And so the first thing that happens within the carpal tunnel pathology is that the, the, the nerve is squeezed within the, the reti plexum retinaculum, right? And when I squeeze it, what's around the nerve is a lot of myelin, right? So that specific pressure will cause a specific pathology called demyelination, which is the most, the earliest feature of pathology to the median nerve, right? Enfermedad uh, demyelinizante, that's what you say in Spanish. And, um, if that's really severe, then after crushing all the myelin outside, then it's the axons itself that start getting hurt in that axonal pathology, right? When the myelin dies and then you get better from the pathology that say you release the carpal tunnel and, and, and cure the patient for carpal tunnel syndrome, then the myelin can be restated. So it's a transient pathology that has great potential of recovery. But once you start damaging the accents, you know, those will have more long-term consequences. There is some recovery of the accents of regrowth sometimes, but that's not very promising. So the importance of doing electrodiagnostics for carpal tunnel is that we can predict recovery. And that is extremely important for physiatrists because we are all about function, right? I want to tell Ms. Hortensia, are you going to be able to continue to pick up the things or continue to write or continue to type on your phone if you're having weakness that's secondary to this pathology? And if, if I'm catching it early, if I'm seeing features, especially of axonal pathology, that's a feature of severity, in carpal tunnel syndrome and recommend more interventional procedures that are going to help prevent that further axonal damage. Any questions about that? This is a very important test and a lot of physiatrists don't like it because they don't, sometimes you know, it gets a lot to understand it because it's very complex, but it's very useful. And we as physiatrists, future physiatrists, should be able to prescribe it properly and perform it because we can do it, right? Um, and as someone was saying, we also do ultrasound, right? Ultrasound is cooler, <laughs> so it's done more. Um, but Within the ultrasound, I can measure the whiteness of the ulnar nerve passing through the carpal tunnel. So in the ultrasound evaluation of carpal tunnel, it's very important that we perform it at where the retinac flexor retinaculum happens. Um, and um, if there is increased widening or flattening of the nerve while in ultrasound that is an early sign of demyelinating pathology it can even lead to axonal pathology right if it if it enlarges 
especially at the retinaculum cut, like when you're putting the ultrasound on top of the flexor retinaculum, it is a sign of nerve damage, right? So the whole reason we do this is to determine what can we do to help these patients. So why are we gonna prescribe to Ms. Hortensia? What are the treatments of carpal tunnel? I think Vanessa asked her about it. This is gonna sound funny because it's rice. I was gonna say arroz. What? Because it's rice, like breast ice, elevate, compressed elevate. I was gonna say arroz. <laughs> yeah, not right. <laughs> but honestly, in the in the clinical evaluation of carpal tunnel syndrome, there is not a lot of indications, even for physical therapy. That's one of the things that we don't really recommend. Um for carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, but addressing corticosteroids, it's steroids. Yeah, steroids are a treatment. Um, how do we administer those steroids, Adra? Do we know? How do we give steroids to someone with carpal tunnel? Do I give you a... <laughs> she says no, say. Um, we can inject it, yeah. It can be, it's best to be done when it's um, ultrasound guided, right? We don't generally do a PO. It's not very common to do PO. And it's, it's not done PO. So sometimes you can do a steroid pack, like oral steroids for um, for other conditions, um, but not, not for couple tunnels. But brazing, right? If you guys remember, maybe if you've seen other lectures on PMNR, one of the big branches of our specialty is called prosthetic and orthotics. How do we say brace in Spanish? Perula. Perula. And as you said, Vanessa, before, there's a lot of like um, differences culturally, but I think the most accept term is perula, right? So we can do a corticosteroid injection or infiltración con esteroides, right? And we can do ultrasound um, diagnostically, but we can also do ultrasound as treatment, right? Because when there is axonal damage, once I've done an EMG and I determine that the damage is severe or has axonal involvement, I need to recommend this patient to have a surgical procedure to improve. Otherwise, it will continue to damage the axons of that nerve and they might lose function on dexterity, which is very important, right? Um, so we either refer for surgeons or ta -da, we physiatrists can do this procedure now. It's called percutaneous release under ultrasound. And so in your practice, mostly, some under ultrasound we can we can break the flexor retinaculum and open it up. In this study um, from 2017, assess the safetyness and the clinical efficacy of this procedure. And as you can see in the in in the right. Um, the symptom severity and functional status scores improved severe, like significantly after a month and even six months. There is long term release, like um, improvement after. There's a little um, feature of how it's done on the, the ultrasound. We take a needle, so on top of it, and this is an in plane injection. We'll eventually you'll see how we do a lot of the injections where like we put it in in concurrence with the beams of the ultrasound to see always the needle coming in. But we do a small trocar. This is not just a regular needle, it's a, it's a trocar. So it's a it's a bigger, um, where we open the skin just a little bit to make sure we can break the retinac the flexor retinaculum. Um, and we can also see how that was effective through the ultrasound by assessing that we don't, we, we see discontinuity of the flexor retinaculum. Um, something very interesting about 
research in VMNR is that um, we assess for function, right? Function is our most important goal. So a lot of the things that we do in research in PMNR include scales like the functional status score, who is going to evaluate functional aspects that are affected through carpal tunnel syndrome, like writing, burdening, right? Holding on a book while reading, gripping on the phone, opening in a jar, um, doing household shorts, carrying groceries and bathing and dressing. So we're gonna try to do this in Spanish. Okay, you try it. Number one, Scum first. Escribiendo. Escribir. Very good. Escribir. Uh, two. Eh, ponerse los botones o cerrarse los botones. Uh, abotonar, right? La ropa, clothing. So, buttoning your clothes, your shirt is abotonar. Very good. Aguantando un libro cuando leyendo. Cuando leer, holding. Sostener un libro a leer o aguantar. That's, that's how Puerto Rican say it. <laughs> I did my internship in Puerto Rico, so I learned. Um, sostener o aguantar el libro, a leer. Very good. Aguantar un teléfono. Aguantar o agarrar, to hold, to grip, is a different action. Spanish is very mixed through that. And so if you said sostener, it, people will understand. But Agarrar, to grip el teléfono. Very good. Opening jars. That's a difficult one. I was like, I had to like look it up, like use my translator. And like, in Spanish is my, my preferred language. But sometimes when you do scale, they have to be very specific to the task. <laughs> Ab abriendo frascas. Abriendo un frasco. Very good. That's a very good one. Excellent. Abrir el frasco. What is household chores? Los deberes de la casa. Very good. Household. Deberes de la casa. Carrying grocery bags. Uh, sosteniendo las bolsas de, um, de compras. Oh, good. That, um, cargar, holding, carrying, right? Cargar, cargar las bolsas del mercado is another expression. Um, las compras. Very good. Bathing and dressing. Bañarse y vestirse. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so when you do a skill in research, you wouldn't do this in 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 specific research. You would need you need to have the functional stat, um, status status quo um validated. Uh but um these are Things that you ask your patients. Can you write, mi Hortensia? Puedes escribir. Can you button your shirt? Se puede abotonar la camisa. Can you hold your phone? Puede agarrar el teléfono. So it's important to learn that we don't not always just ask if the patient is having just pain and numbness and symptoms. We need to know what the functional impact is. And that's much more important um, than just having pain because Ms. Hortensia can just have some pain, but like, is she able to go through her life? Can she go grocery shopping, right? Uh, and that is what physiatrists do better than any other specialty. We really care for how people are doing in life. There is a question here about, can hydrodissection uh, help? So basically, um, 
hydrodissect is a technique where we put the needle to in in where it's placed, it will separate structures. It's best for bursa injections. So subacromial subdeltoid bursa injection is something that we clinically hydrodissect. Um, but for the carpal tunnel, sometimes there's two kinds of ways to do it where you watershed the nerve. So like you put it on top of the nerve so that it um uh kind of baits the the steroid baits the whole nerve or can we do um or are uh, we put it inside um of course when you when you always do it not only with steroid but it has like numbing aging so if you go through the nerve with the needle this will uh, like make the symptoms kind of worse or they can have like persistent paresthesias because you're putting lidocaine in the nerve um, but sometimes, um, it, so it's important to know where you're putting the injection itself. So hydrodissection, uh, there's, there's, there's some room within the, um, carpal tunnel that it wouldn't properly hydrodissect the nerve. It will watershed it. It needs to be within the, the, the neural sheet so that it really affects the nerve. Um, there's another question. How do you evaluate one to five on something like buttoning a shirt? That's a very good question. Um, it, it assesses one, no difficulty and then five severe difficulty. So you can say, um, mild, moderate, severe difficulty or no difficulty doing it. That's how general scales do that. Sometimes that gets into a gray zone, but at least while you're doing research, it gives you um a specific measure to to have. Are you having a moderate I can do it, it takes me five minutes, but if I can finally do it or it's severe where like I physically cannot put it together because the numbness and the loss of sensation has made me lose that capability of doing it. Okay. And uh, I guess it could be keep your relative score, like the pain scale, correct. Yeah, it's a little bit like like that rel relative. Uh, relative um, but for scale, we'll always have, scales will always have a specific way to be addressed, right? In this case, it's one to five, but it's telling me one is no difficulty five is severe, right? Um, so it's, it's just a little bit like that. Um, but that's all I had. Gracias. Um, I hope this was helpful. That's my email. So if you guys have questions, if you guys have anything that we want to address, I'm happy to do that. I don't know. Um, I, I do a lot of coaching for IMGs. You guys, you guys are all medical students from the U.S., but like if you ever have uh, issues with your application or anything, I do a lot of the coaching for that. Or if you have someone who needs help for that, please reach out. And there's also my Instagram because I'm like very active in social media for stuff. So like if you ever want to reach out, please do. And um, there is some, there is a uh, link with feedback that on the chat, please go in, um, give us some feedback so that we can continue to have those activities for you guys. I, I think he just reposted it. Gerardo, do you wanna say a few words? Yeah, th thank you so much. Honestly, this was um, really, when we when I reached out to you, I know we were going back and forth with what we wanted to see and this honestly was great. Um, I know a lot of us are going to auditions now and things like that, so it really gave us a whole uh, spectrum of what we will see and then using these words in our uh, as we move forward. No problem. I love teaching. So anytime you guys um, have an activity like this and you want some help, I'm happy to do so. I think this is very useful. You guys are the future of this specialty. So you got to get excited about what we do and see that the work that we put in is phenomenal and it has a great impact in the people that you will take care of in the future. So Get excited about doing this because actually it's the best specialty ever. I, you know, I've I've worked in other specialties before and it's not as cool as this. Like I'm really happy um 
to be in this field. So I was, for me, it's extremely rewarding to excite other young, young physiatrists like you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you at future events. For sure. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Good night.